Emotions are as powerful in effect as we allow them to. Entire lives of families, communities, and even nations have been affected by actions of individuals driven by emotions. Man is a spirit who has a soul and lives in a body. The soul, the seat of your emotions, was given to you by God for the purpose of connecting what you see and how you feel to a response. Anger, empathy, fondness, pain, passions, comfort or discomfort, desperation, excitement, and many more are elements of your emotions. They say so much about you as a person. Imagine a person without emotions, no empathy, no love, no passion, no pain, no excitement, their hearts beating for nothing. They are neither up nor down, no anger, no fear, no grief, no nothing. You don't want to associate with such a person. You feel they are dead because of this. When you are afraid or vulnerable, that's an emotion. When you grieve over a loss, that's an emotion. When you feel despair as a result of uncertainty, that's emotion. Emotion is not a bad thing in itself. When you are passionate about something, that's emotion as well. When you empathize with someone, that's emotion too. When you feel confidence, that's emotion. You just bought a puppy and you're gushing over it with fondness. That's emotion. You listen, watch or remember something funny, and you laugh, that's emotion. You feel the need to keep going without giving up, that's emotion. Emotions are a language of our subconscious mind transmitted to us to initiate defining actions in a moment. Your strengths and your weaknesses manifest themselves in the emotions that you transmit from the signals you receive. Although you are a spirit, the signals from your spirit can sometimes work with the signals from your subconscious self, your soul, your emotion. It could be God, it could be the devil, people, or just you putting yourself in that spot. This is why your emotions are not so much the kind of things you want to build your life on. It is why you must learn about your emotions and how to control it. Because you see, your emotions are like waves. Today they may be up, and tomorrow they may be down. You might have met people who switch between modes or self. It wears you out being around them, doesn't it? However, this discourse is about you. So let us focus on you right now. The Bible says something about focusing and pursuing your life's course to the fullest. Philippians 3 verse 14 through 15 I press onward, the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Everyone who is mature should take such a view of things. Did you see that? Are you mature? What view is that? I need you to really listen because it gets interesting now. You see, you can control your emotions by knowing who you are, by knowing what you are. You are the person in the driver's seat. You are the one who is in charge. You call the shots here. You were not made for your emotions. Your emotions were made for you. Emotions are suggestions submitted to you through your mind. You, the real you, are the one who chooses what response to give. If you let your emotions take the driver's seat, there will be chaos. There will be conflict. Have you ever had conflicting emotions before? That situation where you wanted one more thing, but felt something else. That situation in which every part of you was screaming aloud, and you just didn't know 
what to do with yourself. You were stuck between giving in and giving up. That you just stood there like you weren't even alive. Do you realize that those emotions manifested along with your inability to arrive at a conclusion? You didn't know what you had to do at that time, and you were an embodiment of conflicting thoughts and responses. If you knew what you had to do, you'd know to silence every other thought and the emotion that accompanies them, and you'd stand on the choices you've made. Your flesh, your body does not always enjoy change, nor the adjustments that come with it. And guess what? It will suggest lots of emotions to you in a bid to persuade you to accept whatever it wants. Pressing, like the Apostle Paul wrote, is not a sweet experience when you start it. It requires effort. It requires work. And boy, does our bodies hate work. Yet you see, that is what it was made for. That's what you were made for. You were created for the great things, not to settle for the less. Remember, we are still focusing on you right now. Do you remember when you wanted to quit? Why was that? What happened? Was it the pain? Was it the pressure? Look at it this way. Everything you faced, the challenges, the pressure, the pain, they were never meant to break you. Instead, they were meant to break your limitations. What are your limitations? Your weaknesses, your sentiments, your comfort zone, your wishful thinking. All these are your limitations. We were all raised to believe that challenges and pains are negatives, but that is not entirely true. Tough stuff go through intense pressure to be the way they are. Look at your precious pearls, for instance. Gold goes through fire for its true beauty to be better appreciated. While it is still in its raw state, it is still gold, isn't it? All of its beauty is still in there. All its features still intact, but hidden underneath the dirt and its raw state. In that raw state, you could walk past that gold and not truly appreciate it or even recognize it. However, when that raw material goes through intense heat, it is purged of all its impurities, and the next time you find it, it will be a totally different material. No longer that raw and dirty looking material, but a fine, glowing treasure. You are gold, my friend, a rare treasure put here on earth by God. The Bible says God has embodied his treasure in vessel made from the earth. This vessel is your body. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Where did God put these treasures? In you. That's right, you are an embodiment of God's great treasures. Maybe no one has told you that before. Maybe you don't even feel like it right now. Maybe you don't understand your own self just yet, but that is who you are. Yet those treasures are in their raw state, and in order to prove that they were put there by God, they have to be unlocked. And how has God prepared to unlock them? Through intense situations. Look at bodybuilders. Their bodies may resist those trainings from the beginning, but keep pressing on nonetheless. They don't let it get to them at all. They bear the hardness, the pains, the heavy weights. And then one day, when you look at them, you see an entirely different person. Yet, it is not a different person. It is the same person who deliberately shut down whatever yearning of their bodies 
and become someone better, someone stronger, and someone faster through intense training. Just like that bodybuilder or athletic champion, you have the faster person inside of you. You have that stronger person inside of you. What separates who you are right now from that person is the training you are willing to subject yourself to. Similarly, challenges are the training of our personality. It brings out the fighter in us. During exercises, some people usually confuse their body's resistance for its inability to go on. But that is just a false interpretation. That is your subconscious self sending you the information of your body's adjustment. Your emotions may present that to you as pain and despair, but it isn't. You have to know the difference and hang in there. The gold does not jump out of the fire because it is hot. Instead, it takes the heat and goes through till the end. It trusts the refiner. It trusts the process. It knows that with each heat, the refiner does not take its eyes off it. With each heat, one impurity is removed. With more heat, more impurities are manifested and removed. It keeps telling itself, just a little while longer. One more, one more, one more, and this will all be over. Once I go through this, which is all, I am never going back to who I used to be. I will be a better element. I will be sought after. My value will increase. You want your value to increase? Control your emotions. You want to be sought after? Control your emotions. You want to change? Take control of your emotions. You must have control. You must have control. Inability to control your emotions, control yourself, will threaten your rising in life and destiny. Proverbs 25 verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Your emotions will limit you. You have to silence that voice of defeat. You fell down. That's fine. Deal with it. Get up. Dust yourself up and try again. Silence that voice of hate and despair. Were you hurt? and now you feel disappointed, deal with it. Life happens to everyone. Get up and try again. Your failures, your pains, your disappointments do not exist to make you back down. They are compliments. Hear me, they are compliments. They came to prove the champion in you. Don't lock yourself in the room and cower in fear. Don't shut down and cry your eyes out. Don't throw in the towel just yet. There is no room for fear. There is no room for despair. There is no room for quitting. There is no room for any such limiting emotions right now. Make a choice today. Do you want to win? How badly do you want it? Then rise up. Get yourself together. Summon the mighty man or woman in you. You are brave. You are not a coward. You are not weak. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yours is not a spirit of fear. You are not weak. Yes, you are human and have the right to be vulnerable, but you are not weak. You are strong. You have control. You are supposed to. Therefore, take it. Take control. Yours is a spirit of love. Yours is a spirit of power. Yours is a spirit of a sound mind. Embrace the real you and take the driver's seat. Do not let your emotions rule you anymore. It is time to be better. The opportunity to see a new day is a gift that no amount of money can ever buy you. The rich with all their wealth cannot purchase days for themselves. 
No one has that kind of power except God. I want you to know that it is not your alarm clock, the cock crowing outside, the person who tapped you, or your own ability that wakes you up each morning. You wake up because God wakes you up. No matter how deep your sleep, how wonderful or terrible a dream you might be having, how tired your body, when it is time to wake up, you open your eyes. I need you to know that this is not your working, it is the working of God. Not because He owes you that, but because of His mercies. Your yesterday may have been filled with so many sorrows and disappointments. You may have committed so many sins yesterday and messed up so much. Yet you wake up to see a brand new day each morning as long as God wants. You see, our Father in Heaven does not show us this kind of mercy because we are good enough for anything, but because of His mercies on us. So many good people, healthy people, kind-hearted and productive or ambitious people may go to bed but not wake up from their sleep in the morning. These people should have even more reasons than you to welcome a new day. Yet they aren't here right now. Not because they are bad people or they sinned against God. It's not that God loves them less than you or anything like that. The answer is this. God chooses to show you mercy. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. No one knows what tomorrow looks like. The Bible does not even tell us that tomorrow is guaranteed. Though God promises long life and good things for the future, yet the sovereignty of it lies only in His hands and not in our plans. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. You see, Every new day is the tomorrow you planned about yesterday, yet many of us take it for granted when we do see it. The purpose of sharing these with you is so that you might learn the value of each day and consider every morning a blessing. The Bible says that God's great love is the reason we are not consumed because His compassions never fail. Every morning you wake up to meet a new grace, a new mercy, a new favor, another opportunity to be better, to win, to change for good, to grow, and become who God wants you to be. Therefore, regardless of how your yesterday or entire life has been, look at each new day through the lenses of gratitude. Look at each morning as God presenting you with a brand new gift called today, with a smile on His face and love in His heart, despite knowing you for who you are. Many times we look at the things we have or don't have yet, and we allow them to hinder our thanks. But look, my friend, your true gratitude shouldn't be only about what you have in your life or don't have yet. If you take out the time to analyze your life, you may find out that you have more than you are grateful to God for. Some of the things you may lack right now and think would make you more grateful if only God gave them to you is actually God showing, doing you a favor. Why? Because through the limitations of our minds as humans, think we need some things in our lives, not knowing that those things have the potential to destroy us or even those around us. However, God in His mercy and omniscience, understanding this, keeps us from having some of those things to save us from their effect. If only our eyes were open to see some of these things, we would know that we must thank God for literally everything going on in our lives every time. David wrote in Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 through 5, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. My friend, whether things are going great or not for you, as a child of God alive today, alive in Christ, you have every reason to start your day thanking God. Don't start your day complaining. Don't start your day looking at your deadlines. 
Don't start your day looking at yesterday's losses and failures. Don't start your day looking at those who are for you and those who are against you. Instead, start your day looking to God in gratitude. Look to your heavenly Father. Those who do will come out radiant. And instead of shame, you'll be surrounded with confidence because you have soaked yourself up in the love of your Father, the monarch of the world the universe who's got everything in his hands. Maybe you don't know exactly what to thank God for at the start of a new day. Let me help you. Here are a few things to thank God for. Number one, his unfailing mercies over you. David wrote in the Psalms, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. As I already impressed on you, each new day is a display of God's mercy enduring over our life. Start your day Thank God for showing you his mercies and blessing you with another brand new day along with every opportunity associated with it. Number two, his patience with you. Through the blessing of each new day, God gives you another opportunity to be better, to come to him, to embrace his love. Second Peter chapter three, verse 15 says, remember that we are saved because our Lord is patient our dear brother Paul told you the same thing when he wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. Many of us keep pushing God away. Some even curse God. Some postpone their repentance because of one reason or another. Yet I want you to know this. With each new day, God is displaying his love and patience with you. Not to encourage you to keep doing what you have been doing, but instead to have another chance to do what's right. To have another chance to come to him another day to save your soul, to protect and deliver you. It's like the father of the prodigal son waiting earnestly for the sun to show up on the horizon every day without giving up. If God could close the page on you, you'd be lost forever, but he hasn't yet. Instead, you have another day to come to him. Isn't that worth thanking God for? Number three, the gift of salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ. If there is one thing to be constantly thankful to God for every morning is the blessed hope of glory and eternal life that you have in Jesus Christ. Not only does this guarantee your eternal future, it secures your today. Colossians chapter 1 verses 12 through 13 says, And you will joyfully give thanks to the Father who has made you able to have a share in all that he has prepared for his people in the kingdom of light. God has freed us from the power of darkness, and he brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. Through your life in Christ Jesus, you have access to God and to the inheritance of every saint in God's family. Through eternal life and salvation, you have an advantage over the rest of the world, God on your side. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. God decided to let his people know this rich and glorious secret which he has for all people. This secret is Christ himself who is in you. He is our only hope for glory. Thank God for forgiving you each time you turn to him for forgiveness and for loving you like you never sinned before. Thank God that you can come to him as an accepted son or daughter. Thank him that you can ask him for anything and he will do it according to his will so much that you will be fine. And lastly, it is worth thanking God for some of the trivial things that you might actually be overlooking in your life. How about thanking God for the air you breathe, the sunlight on your skin, your eyes, and every other organ in your body? How about thanking God for food, for clothes, good drinking water, and good health? How about thanking God for your child or children, for your spouse, your sibling, the salvation of each of them, or the fact that you still have them today. The list is endless, my friend. If you look at all of these things, you will discover that you shouldn't step out of your bed without giving thanks to God. He deserves it every day. Today, you can make a change and ask God to help you stay grateful for all that He is and all that He does for you each day. Let us pray and give thanks to God together. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that it is a good thing to give you thanks all the time, especially at the start of my day. Today, I choose to make this commitment and to start by thanking you. 
Regardless of what may or may not be happening in my life right now, I won't deny the fact that you have been good to me. Thank you for your endless mercies over me. Thank you for placing your attention on me. I can never fully comprehend why you care for me or love me the way you do, Lord. But I am grateful. Forgive me for taking your love for granted before now. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for helping me to see the light that is in Christ and to embrace that life. Thank you for helping me to put my faith in Jesus and to receive the eternal life that you give to all who receive him. Father, everyone who looks to you finds strength, hope, and light. I am thankful because you've got my back at all times. Therefore, I will not fear the devil, this world, or everything in it. Instead, I will start my journey and make my way through life thanking you because you are my Father, you love me, and you always have everything under control. Take all my praise today, dear God, for the food, the water, the air, the health, and for my loved ones. Everything that is in your hand is fine. So in confidence, I thank you because we are all in your hands. Continue to glorify your name in our lives, Father, and I commit that as long as I breathe, I will forever be thankful to you, for you are my source, my Father, my God. Amen. How do you feel about being a Christian in a world like ours today? Everything seems out of order. What should be condemned is praised, and what was once praiseworthy and should be upheld is now mostly forbidden or scorned at. No one seems to notice the chaos everywhere, the decadence reigning over communities and people, tearing lives and destinies apart. No one seems to see, no one seems to care. But they should. They should be worried. There is trouble here and more trouble coming, and they have to escape it before it comes. And this is why we are here. This is why we preach Jesus. This is why we preach God's message to them, so that peradventure they might hear, see, and have their hearts opened to receive this saving power in Jesus, be transformed and saved from the coming judgment. Agreed, usually it feels like you are the only one seeing this. You feel you are one of the only few sane remaining. And of course, the world will call you insane. Although, Things happen to each person on earth regardless of who they are, where they come from, what they believe, what they do not believe, how they believe it, or any such thing. The difference, however, between all men and you, the child of God, is that you believe in God. In other words, the difference between you and everyone else is your faith in God. What is the unique thing about believing in God, having faith in Him? Hebrews 10.38 says, And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Who is this righteous one? You are. You are God's righteous one through your faith in Jesus Christ. How did you become God's righteous one? When you came to Jesus, believing in Him for everything He did through His death, burial, and resurrection, God says now you have the righteousness of Jesus. When God sees you, He doesn't see what you once was, but what Jesus is. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. When He looks at you, He sees the blood of Jesus, purity, and a place of abode for His glory. This is the free gift that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Although, once we're like everyone else who don't believe, set for the destruction that was going to come to the world and all souls that are not saved. However, now, through your faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ that gives you a brand new life, your faith in the blood that washed away your sin for a fresh new start, you have become a saint, God's special one. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may desire the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our faith, my friend, is our strong point. You see, it is one thing to believe in God for eternal life. It is another thing to believe in God for every circumstance that you go through. Both situations require faith, but only one guarantees a sustained result in practical life every passing day. You do not only need faith to receive eternal life from God, you need it to sustain you through this life. Every believer in God does. You can't survive or become more like Jesus in this world without believing in God for that transformation, or else the world will transform you. So, when God says that His righteousness, that is you, shall live by faith, what is He talking about? He means that you will not only believe in Him for salvation, but for everyday life. You will go to bed believing in God. You will eat believing in God. You will exercise believing in God. You will go to work, write that exam, meet new people, write that proposal, get married, have your kids. You will do everything believing in God. This understanding helps take away the pressure from you and gives you a place of rest in the Lord Himself. Hence, in everything you do, you rely on God's faithfulness, His intelligence, and His purpose for you. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. This is a progressive experience for every person that believes in God. Do you know why? Have you ever wondered why sometimes it seems hard believing in God? Why does it seem difficult to just throw it to God and leave Him to handle stuff? Maybe it's because we humans like to be in control. Maybe we just want to know the ins and outs. We want to know the logic on how it will work out so that we might be able to recreate it next time. Maybe we want to help ourselves, you know, prove we are not weak. Maybe we just want to make sure that we are not making a mistake. Maybe we are just simply afraid, unable to truly trust God to handle something as valuable as our lives' issues. But, dear believer, this is faith. Faith is letting go and letting God. It is how the believer should live. Without it, we will die. Without it, can we call ourselves children of our Father? Believing in God is not only what makes us believers, it is also what makes us grow into who God intends for us to be. Now, this is where I want us to focus on. What happens when you begin to believe God? Your faith, my friend, has the power to change you. It has the power to frame the kind of world that affects you. This is why the Bible says that you shall live by it. You can't survive without it. You need it as a shield from every attack that the devil and the world would launch against you. And when you embrace faith or belief in God, something happens to you. Believing God in a time like this would require a complete brokenness. This brokenness refers to submission, submission of your will to God's, the submission of that inner desire to be in charge of your life. You know, for example, when people go through trying times, for example, the world would tell you that you don't need God. They may even mock you that you are wasting your time believing God, that you probably need a distraction, a coping mechanism until you get over it. Some even tell you to manipulate your way through it, cut corners, compromise standards, cheat if you have to, tear down if you have to, and so on. However, for you, it is not the same. You see, because you have submitted yourself to God, you have no reason to fear. You are not in haste to get anywhere. You believe in His good plans for you regardless of what is happening with you right now because you trust Him. Jeremiah 29.11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Let's say, for example, you are trying to progress in your career, and you took an exam which you failed. Normally, the world would tell you that you are a failure. Maybe this is not your area. 
Maybe you have to bribe someone. Maybe you need to lie on your resume, and so on. However, because you believe in God, instead of feeling cast down, you are full of joy. Why? Because you believe in God. You believe that although what you want seems not to be working, you are not after what you want, but after what He wants. His will is your heart's desire. So whether you fail or succeed, you want to fulfill His will. Therefore, you rejoice in the delay. You rejoice in the challenges. The world does not understand this way of doing things, but it is the life of faith. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19 says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and enables me to tread on the heights. This right here is the declaration of faith. You believe. What if my faith is wavering? We are in the last days, and the faith of many are overwhelmed by distractions. There is a lot of challenges when you look around you. There is bad news when you turn on the TV. There is fear everywhere. There is so much to do to survive each day, so much chaos everywhere. If you let the flow carry you along, soon you will find yourself speaking their language, feeling cold on the inside, answering life with doubt and uncertainty. Faith will become inconsistent. Why? Because it is being starved. However your faith is wavering, turn to the Word. Build back the lifestyle of reading your Bible and praying. Romans 10.17, talking about faith, says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. Starve your fears that make you question or doubt God. Instead, feed your faith that makes you believe. The more you keep reading your Bible, meditating on it, praying and obeying it, something will begin to happen to you. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You will believe what you keep observing, and consequently, you will become what you believe. That's what you will have. Hence, why should you focus on what helps you know God more and to believe Him much more? Do you want to live holier? Do you want to obey God more? Do you want to walk in the fear of God more? Do you want to hear God and see Him direct you more? Do you desire to have the power to resist the pressures of the motions of sin in our society? Then you need to expose yourself to the only truth, the one with the power to save. Read it more. Meditate on it more. Commit to stand on what it says. Believe it and don't replace that faith with the suggestions of this world because this world is the enemy of God. The more you look at the Word of God, the more you begin to look like what it says you are. Faith changes you when you hold on it based on the Word of God. It is time for you to reject the lies that make you doubt and embrace the truth that makes you believe and produce fruit. There is an important message I hope to communicate with you, and it is this. Don't be the kind of Christian who seems to see or know more of what the devil is doing than what God is doing or has done. Don't see Satan as being so powerful that it will require so much from God to overcome him in your life. If you think this way, you will live your life steadily struggling instead of taking advantage of everything that you are and have in God. The rest of this video will help me to better communicate this to you and also help you have a better grasp of this good news. Yes, there is good news, my friend. In this battle, God will always emerge the winner, not the devil. You see, the enemy Satan has one single commitment to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus told us. He has no other joy, 
His only satisfaction is the fall of the child of God. Everything he does is aimed at that. Peter wrote in his letter in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's always working, whether you are aware of it or not. Someone might say, Satan will come at someone who have sinned against God or someone who is in his way only. However, this is not entirely so. Although sin will open the door to the devil in your life, it is not the only reason that might put you on Satan's radar. For instance, Jesus was perfect. He was God in the flesh. And as a man, he had just gone to be baptized by the esteemed prophet John the Baptist. Immediately, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove had come upon him, and the voice of the Father had spoken from heaven to validate him. Thereafter, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, fasting and praying for 40 days and nights, only to be tempted by the devil while he was there. Now, let me ask you a minute. If Satan was willing to tempt God when he became man in Jesus Christ, do you still think only sinners are on his list? that you are a child of God, living for God, or striving to do so, having compassion, using your gifts for the advancement of God's kingdom. Living holy and hating sin makes you a target of the enemy, my friend. Therefore, we are constantly dealing with oppositions, battles, attacks on our faith. It is not merely because you did something wrong, but because you are on God's side. You are Satan's enemy now because you are loved by God. Hence, after Peter talked about the devil as a roaring lion, he went further to say in the next verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. So, while you deal with that secret struggle, remember that you are in a battle. While you struggle with the need in your finances, remember that it's a battle. While your child is bringing you heartaches, remember that you're in a battle. And while you go through these things, it is easy to confront opposition, you know, Satan's henchmen, who will try to weaken your faith to turn your back from following after God. An example is guilt. Are you currently struggling with guilt? Many people have turned back from the faith because of guilt. Many have fallen into depression because of guilt. Some people have even ended their own lives because of the feelings of guilt. You see, walking under the weight of guilt is one of the heaviest and tormenting burdens you can ever give yourself. Guilt takes something that you did yesterday, tries to shove it in your face as you identify, even when you have acknowledged how wrong that thing was and are working to make amends. Guilt tells you that you are not good enough for the best of today because you are not a part of the good ones. Remember Judas Iscariot? Guilt drove him to end his life after betraying Jesus. Yes, what he did was wrong. Just like Peter, I believe if he had returned to God, he would have been forgiven and saved. How about Adam and Eve? After eating the forbidden fruit, instead of coming to God who was able to fix them, they ran away from him instead. That's what guilt does. It keeps you far from God, far from faith, far from help. Some people stop praying because of guilt. Some stop attending church because of guilt. Some have stopped serving in God's vineyard because of guilt. But this is not the working of God, nor of the Holy Spirit. You see, what the Holy Spirit does is convict you of the thing you've done. What does this mean? It means that he brings your attention to it, shows you how wrong it is and why you shouldn't do such a thing. Then he shows you how best to go about such a thing and what you would have benefited if you'd done that prior. This leads to remorse and then to repentance. The Bible calls this kind of remorse a godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. The Holy Spirit is not seeking to send you packing from God's family. It's the devil suggesting that to you. It's not God telling you not to talk to him because you did something wrong. That's the devil. In fact, God wants you coming to him with your biggest defeat, your deepest pains and your failures. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Wash and make yourself clean. 
Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they should be like wool. This is like God saying, Commit yourself to doing what is right. Keep yourself free from sin and error. Do what is right all the time. But you know what? If you are at a tight corner and struggling to let go of your sins, come let us settle the matter together. I am the one who forgives your sins. I am the God that heals you. I am your solution. You don't have to stop being a Christian because you failed yesterday or the day before that. There is no sin too great that I can't forgive. There is no sin too deep that the blood can't wash. Come to me, open up, and let me heal you. And this is the battle. I am not just talking about sin, dear saints. I am talking about that thing you're confronted with right now. It's still the same strategy Satan is using. He may not use guilt in your case. He may use fear. He may use disappointment. He may use defeats. He may use stagnation. He may use distractions. He may use many things to try to separate you from God, to keep you down, to destroy your soul. But hear me, saints, this is good news. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. In whatever battle you are faced with, you, the child of God, are more than a conqueror. You see, the battles of your life are not supposed to be handled by you. They are God's. He said in his word that whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. This means that because you are God's possession, your business is his business. If you trust him with it, your cares are his cares. If you cast them on him, your battles are his. If you put your faith in him. What did David tell Goliath after he threatened to destroy the young man as they stood before the armies of their respective nations? 1 Samuel chapter 17, 45, verse 47 says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by my sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. These were the words of a young lad who had not been trained in any military skill and had no weapon on him. Yet his faith was strong. He had refused to put on the king's armor because he wasn't used to them. He didn't need the king's security to feel secured. He had God, and that was enough. You know how that story ended. Indeed, God took up the battle that this young man had given him in faith. And of course, you know when God is in the battle on your side, you can't lose. A shot at Goliath from his sling was all David had to do. God took that stone and smashed it into the skull of the giant and he sank down dead. This is what happens when you put your faith in God. God will never lose a battle that is handed over to him. Are you fighting one battle right now? Are you caught in a web of guilt right now? And you keep falling back into the mud of your past again and again because Satan has you glued to it. Give God your battles, my friend. He can't take it if he isn't given the go ahead. He can't do anything if you don't give him room like David did. When David said, the battle is the Lord's, it was God's cue to step in. God knew that and he stepped in. It was a great and unforgettable victory that day. Talk to God today about your need. Mention that guilt and ask him to wash you with the blood of Jesus. Hand over your shame and defeat to him. Hand over the bills and oppositions to him. Then get up from there as the winner that you are in him. The Bible says that whatever is born of God has overcome the world already. This is a stance of faith that takes God by his word. So I encourage you today, God will win the battle for you. You just put your faith in him. He is worth trusting. His words are worth believing. And if he says that whoever calls on him will not be put to shame, that is true. Turn your eyes from the guilt of the sins because you've been forgiven. 
Turn your attention from the death you're seeing around you and focus them on the one who is both resurrection and life. Welcome to your season of peace and rest. God is fighting for you. Find rest in Him. Emotions are hidden attributes of our outward character. There are basic things that control our emotions. Those are our limbic systems. According to the psychologist, the ultimate is God Almighty, the master of the universe. Do your emotions control you or are you controlled by your emotions? When you're in a good emotional disposition, calm and every action you take is geared toward the leadings of the Holy Spirit, you can say that you control your emotions. The Holy Spirit can help control every one of our emotions positively. You are knowledgeable, but are you emotionally stable? Emotions are the generic term for subjective, conscious experiences that are primarily characterized by psychological expressions, biological reactions, and mental state. Are you mentally stable in your reaction to social issues in life? Are you able to identify your own emotions and those of others to self-motivate and know how to monitor your emotions and those around you? If you are self-aware, meaning that you know your emotional stability and are able to manage it, it's true. How about that of others who would snap at you at every point in time, talking down at you and making you angry deliberately? Let us look at how to know when we allow our emotions to control or rule us. Are you argumentative? Do you argue over every issue of life? Do you not listen? When you do not listen to other people, you always think you're right and others are wrong. You need to watch it and always pay attention to others too. Do you blame others for your mistakes? There are people who blame everyone but themselves for their mistakes. If you are, you must examine yourself. Turn to God Almighty and ask for assistance. He will come to your aid. Do you experience emotional outbursts? At every given time, you're edgy or cranky, always angry. Before anyone can talk to you, they will first check your outward expressions. You can come out of it and have a positive disposition towards life. God will help with your thoughts and clean them with the word purifier from the Bible. So you'll then be in charge of your emotions. The word of God assures and soothes various challenges of life. It's applicable to emotions and other aspects of life. Read it and pray. It'll go a long way towards helping you. Seek first God's kingdom and righteousness and all other things will be added to it. This is a blank check. Take advantage of it. Check all of the above mentioned items and reconsider seeking spiritual assistance. If you think it's normal to express anger, then check the Bible and have a redress. Who can help you? Only God Almighty can help you and change your emotions into positive expressions and you will have peace. Let us look at Proverbs 16:32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. When you are slow to anger, that is a negative emotional outburst. The Bible says that you're better than the mighty. Let us look at how we know that we control our emotions. You are self-aware. You know your emotional dispositions. You're able to manage it and control it. You have empathy. You feel for others. And you're able to put yourself in others' positions, feel for them, and sympathize with them. You have high self-regulation. You're able to manage yourself and others. Should there be any challenges, you are able to regulate everything without it turning into chaos. You are highly motivated. You're at the top of your game, always highly positive with words of encouragement and enthusiasm, not a moment of giving in to the devil. You challenge yourself, encourage yourself, and support yourself with a positive attitude. What we see creates the behaviors that form our character. We must first check our thoughts, 
Our thoughts are mostly preoccupied with their negative impact. Never feel your emotions with what you can't control and what you can't help when the repercussions happen. Let us look at negativity, negative emotions like envy. Are you envious of friends or people without even knowing if it's wrong? Envy can kill. Depression is an emotional state in which a person gives up on everything and wishes to end their life. This can also end your life journey, so take it to God. What is depressing you? What is eating you up emotionally? Take it to God Almighty for restoration and everlasting peace. Frustrations. Are you frustrated? You've tried so many things and it seems to not be working. Don't be frustrated. Ask God for help. He will make a way where there is no way. Sadness. Are you downcast? Are you sad about an issue? Take it to God. Guilt. Do you feel guilty over certain issues? Repent and stop hurting yourself. Let it all down on God. This feeling can emanate bad emotions that can affect you. Grief. Are you grieving over the loss of a friend, family member, or loved one? If this is affecting you negatively, take it to the Most High God who will give you peace of mind. Fear. Is there any false thing projecting fear inside you, causing you fear, affecting your productivity? Take it to God. Shame. What caused you shame? Instead, what is it that you did that makes you feel ashamed? Of allowing your emotions to ride you? Take it to God Almighty and repent never to do it again. He will direct your path and take it away. Do you have doubts about a situation that is beyond you, but you believe it's possible? Take it up with the Most High God. Jealousy. Jealousy can make a person do something that he or she's not expected to do. Negative vibes that can make you sick. It's a negative emotional challenge that needs to be worked on. Disliking people or friends or colleagues for no reason can kill. All these negative emotions do not encourage healthy living. Positive emotions come with great impact, influence from God Almighty. Let us check that too. Smiling, calm heart, happiness and inner joy all these things come from god almighty let us look at the scripture let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another tender-hearted forgiving one another the bible makes it clear that all wrath and anger should be put away as these are indications that we are not in control of our emotions but that they are dictating to us. Bitterness can destroy good and fantastic relationships. Just imagine a young boy of 17 who went out with his friend for a dinner and ended up slaughtering her for rituals. What manner of evil is that? This should never be found among us as children of the highest God. Let us look at the description of bad emotions in the Bible. Proverbs 29.11 says, A fool vents all his feelings but a wise man holds them back. The Bible describes anyone who displays negative emotions as a fool. Are you wise or foolish? A man of wisdom should be preferred to a fool of foolishness. Therefore, we must immediately ask for help from Almighty God. Brethren, if we are in control of our anger, you would know the triggers and limits, and there would be a check-in in your spirit to let you know that you're above board. Control your emotions rather than allowing them to control you. How can you control your emotions? He is the one who can help us without prejudice. First and foremost, you have to ask God for help. Remove negativity from your thoughts. Take it up from your current thought level. What preoccupies your mind? What do you think about when you're alone? Do you magnify or overthink issues? Ponder a little and move on to engage your mind with positive things. Read and listen to good messages from your pastor. Forgive people before the offense occurs. 
Offenses will come. People around you will deliberately hurt you, but don't over magnify it. Just take it away and let it go. This happens through the help of the Holy Spirit. Take away the murmuring in your thoughts. Do you complain about what you have and don't have? Do you grumble over things? Take it out of your mind so it doesn't affect you negatively. Thank God for everything and you'll see positive change. How do we get rid of toxic emotions? Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. There must be peace with God in your heart, the peace that supersedes all understanding. It is God that gives it. The world can't give it to you. A human being cannot give it to you. The community cannot give it. Only God can give that. He is available to you today. Ask Him for peace of mind. If you have peace, you have everything. Everlasting joy. Embrace emotional healing. You must know what triggers negative emotions and avoid it. Or at every point in time, ask the Holy Spirit for help. You must be emotionally intelligent. Negative emotions can come from triggering events, like an overwhelming workload, for example. Negative emotions are also the result of our thoughts surrounding an event. The way we interpret what happened can alter how we experience the event and whether or not it causes stress. There are suggestions that may help or keep you from toxic emotions. You must first of all check what works for you. This helps me greatly. Ask God for help. At this point, you notice wrong expressions of negative emotions. Realize where you are. Take a break. Breathe in and out. Leave the scene of the event or be excused from the conversation. Calm yourself down and reflect on positive memories and successes and reflect on them. Hang out with people who love you. You should enjoy some positive friends in your circle. Hang out with them. To avoid suicide or negative actions that will cause your loved ones pain, avoid being alone. Try something different or new. Take a short walk. Listen to music. Draw or write short stories. Simply do it. Something new. You'll be glad you did. Write down your worries. I did this recently when my children were returning to school and there was no visible cash at hand. I was so disturbed, I prayed, Dear God, please help me. I wrote about what I would need, ranging from tuition, transportation, provisions, etc. I prayed and handed it over to God Almighty. Guess what? I had peace and I had directions to make some calls. God did it. They all went to school and it's a thing of the past now. You must not worry about anything. It can't solve the problem. Rather, it will aggravate it. Write down what's working for you in life. The following may be an addition, but please get what works for you. And finally, make sure you're in control of your emotions rather than your emotions controlling you.